Buongiorno. I will start with Italian. Good morning. We're a small group today, but there are other people following us online as always. Welcome. My name is Patrizia Morgante in charge of communication at UISG. Before we begin, before we give the floor to Sister Marianne and to welcome her, I wanted to give you some technical information. She will be speaking English, therefore, if uh, you need translation, you need to wear your headsets to understand English. No, do not touch that. Right. Can you switch that off? That is the microphone. The microphone only you only needs to be turned on when you need to speak because the camera will turn to you automatically. Now to change the volume, it's here on the side. So you may you put it to the left for her, to the right for me. Italian, let's try if it works everything. Can you hear? Can you hear the translation into Italian? Yeah, let's make a trial. Is it working? Can you hear this? Perfect. Okay. Quindi io tornerò, torno all'italiano. So I go back to Italian. When we hold these meetings, well, first of all, I wanted to explain that we're really happy to have Sister Marianne. We took advantage of this uh, time because she was here in Rome. However, we will organize uh, more things in the future with more time. But Marianne's experience uh, in uh, helping and accompanying congregations, especially missionary congregations, is uh, very important it's a very important experience that's why we realized that this was a need in uh, religious life as well i don't know if uh, we ever heard of a, of the burnout sometimes when we work in this um, area sometimes we are overcharged surcharged so we'll ask mary and to accompany us uh, on this topic and then you will transmit uh, this message to others to reflect on this theme. When we have these meetings, we usually begin with a moment of prayer since uh, the topic that Marianne will be developing is quite dense. I would not add too many words. We chose some music that I will now play. I will leave this mu music on and then I'll read one thing in Italian at the end. I just ask you to let go of everything and empty yourselves so you can then take in what we need and what we will be listening to.
Abbracciare l'infinito. Embracing infin infinity. I uh, take, I use a small method to let myself be embraced by the infinity. Be a creature. We are accustomed to doing, to producing, creating, invent, work. Can we go back to being uh, not the potter, rather the vase, uh, the clay? A creature among the creatures. Instead of always being authors, and victims of a life filled with goals that need to be reached. Let us uh, go back as if we were kids. Man, the man is like an island. My life is like an island. And I walk on it, on the beach, the mountaintops, and even uh, even in the creeks and when I have finished uh, walking around the island and I go back to the starting point uh, I realize uh, one thing there where the island uh, where the island is uh, finished where the island finishes that's where the ocean begins the border of uh, the island, the end of the island is the beginning of infinity. The border and the end of man is God. Bene, continuiamo la nostra preghiera e adesso chiedo alla mia collega... We continue our prayer, we conclude our prayer and now I ask my uh, colleague Florence to introduce this to Marianne. Not under the, the video, but I want to welcome Marianne. She's a sister of Mercy and she has been working for almost 30 years with the GRS, Jesuit Refugee Service, as a psychologist and giving training also to people who are working with the migrants when they can face some uh, more difficult uh, situation. So she has been working as psychologist and consultant and also trainer. Um, she was She's from Australia. Um, with the GRS, she has been in many places in Asia. Um, and today, she's teaching in Boston College in the US after doing that also, and maybe she's still doing it in Oxford. So she's a very international person moving from one place to another to help the sister, and I think it's a focus, to help the sister who can face some uh, demanding 
text. So thank you, Marianne, for helping us to be more and more aware of uh, sometimes a difficult situation where we are working. Thank you very much. Um, working, if I can. Excellent. Um, first of all, thank you and um, thank you, Patricia, for your lovely prayer and it's lovely to be here. I would just start by explaining a little bit more, as Florence has said, in recent years, I have spent a lot of time training younger people in a master's degree to work in global work. Global work in war zones, conflict zones, refugee settings. But I also have then found myself working with um, humanitarian workers in different parts of the world. Some of them are religious, but a lot are not. So what I'm sharing today is the work with humanitarian workers, but I think it has a lot of applications to religious. And I would try with you to make the applications. So the talk is called, Who Cares for the Caregivers? And this is something like, when we work as missionaries, when we work as people on the front line, we are looking at the hard work that we do but also who supports us and what needs to support us behind that. And that's the work that I'm wanting to concentrate on. I'm focusing in particular on what we're calling demanding context. So it's not just ordinary context, but demanding. Ones that can sometimes challenge us beyond our normal capacity. To proceed, I want to all well, I want, first of all, to talk about what is well-being? What is it that we are trying to attain? There's a number of words that are used now in our language about well-being. And one of the words that's a strong word that is coming through in the research is flourishing. How do we help people in the settings where they are to flourish, to be their full self? So I'm going to move between using the term well-being and also the term flourishing. I have a model. It has seven aspects. So we have the term well-being and this is achieved when we think all seven aspects are related to each other. Interestingly, the first aspect is material. It's quite difficult for us in difficult contexts when we don't have the correct resources, the correct materials, cars, nowadays internet, um, safe environment, um, good place for sleeping, a place where we're not gonna get unwell, health, good health. As you know, in community and in settings like that, also the social environment, the people that we connect with, who else is there in our space? I've mentioned a tiny bit already, health, physical health, biological health. We need to keep strong and well in these settings. This is the one that is probably the most complex emotional health. We talk about people needing to be emotionally well, to have emotional sensibility, to be emotionally together. For us as well, as you know, there's an overlap with our spiritual health. What is it that's nourishing us in our spiritual life in these complex settings? One that would be familiar to you as well, but often isn't talked about in the literature is cultural. Our different understandings of why we are there, how we relate to the people we're relating to, our beneficiaries, and what's their cultural interpretation. 
And this one here is what I would call our cognitive, our thinking. What is it that we bring to the setting and the well-being that is in our mind, our thoughts, our narrative, as we sometimes say, that's going through our work? All of these, all of these need a minimum standard to be met. So if one of them is not correctly balanced, it affects all of the others. So a minimum standard of housing, a minimum standard of intellectual stimulation, a minimum standard of spirituality, a minimum standard of our culture. So. When I talk about well-being, I'm not just talking about between the ears, what's happening in the head. And I'm not just talking about what's happening in the physical health. I'm talking about a holistic model of wellness. They're all interrelated. And we can't say one is more important than the other. This is a bit of a challenge for us because sometimes as religious, we think the spiritual is the most important and the material is not so important because we have a vow of poverty. No. In this model, we're saying they all need to have minimum standards. I just want to then focus on a couple of key aspects that are coming through in complex settings. Because this model is one that would apply to any setting, but when we get to complex settings where we are working in dangerous settings, safety becomes a very big concern. And I don't just mean here safety from hostage, safety from bullets, safety from roadblocks. I mean feeling safe in the communities and, in, and, and when I say communities, I'm not just meaning the religious communities, but the communities where people are and safe to be yourself safe to be able to speak. People can say, I am safe. And that's very important. Our beneficiaries who we work with, we work hard for them to feel safe. We need to also feel safe. Here is another one which in, if I can say in religious life is something that sometimes is a bit of a challenge, participation. I am involved. It's not just people telling me what to do or how to do it. I participate. I help to say what it is to feel safe. I help to say what are my basic needs. I am actively involved. One of the problems sometimes, and this can happen in humanitarian work, it can happen in religious life, where my organization says, this is what you need. And I say, no, 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 no. I also need this. So it, it's an engagement. It's not just being given. There's also the issue of development. I'm growing. I'm not just in this work and I'm doing the work, but I'm standing still. It's a work that's extending me. It's enabling me to grow. And I'm growing spiritually. I'm growing cognitively. I'm growing emotionally. So the model of well-being that I'm presenting to you is one that's very interrelated. But it's got some core principles of the actual sisters that we're talking about, or in my instance, the humanitarian workers I'm talking about, of them having an active involvement in shaping their well-being. All of these contexts promote, I'm calling it here staff well-being, but we could equally say sisters' well-being or father's well-being, brother's well-being. It's a, it's a dynamic model. And I think if I can say some of us have concentrated more on some aspects than on others. And that's one of the um, things that we're discovering now. This model is 10 years old. So it's not completely new, but it's one that we've used a lot to help people to look at beneficiaries, but also at staff. What are the elements of their well-being? But in particular, I like the model of the involvement of the person themselves. 
of them engaging in their challenges. I can easily come back to these when we have questions. I'm now going to start with a model um, explaining how we might want to understand what it is that is influencing the people we're concerned about. And as you can see on this so far empty model, it's a tree, but there are roots. And what I'm going to do is just put, and I've just put some, and I'm sure we could add a lot more later, of what we see on the top and what might be happening underneath. So here's, here's one word, disaffected. Sometimes when we work with people in complex settings, our sisters or our co-workers, they can be annoyed, they can be irritated, they can be stressed, stretched. One word that we use is they're disaffected. They're not in good form. So we go around thinking, how can we help these people to be better? How can we help them to be stronger? Because we, it's not easy to live with people who are disaffected. It's not easy to be around them. They're hard to engage with. This might be an unusual word. Another word that we sometimes use is the word cowboy. In complex settings, we often have missionaries or sisters or priests who work who are um, outgoing. They are um, entrepreneurs. As I say, one word is maverick. Sometimes that makes them not easy to work with, but it means they can put up with much. I've met many. In many parts of the world, I've met people who are extraordinary, but they would not be easy in a normal setting. It's their extraordinaryness, their entrepreneurial or their maverick nature that keeps them doing that work. We often hear now about the word burnout. People come back from the field and they are rubbish. They can't function, they cry a lot, they can't eat. And we say, oh, they're burnt out. We need to send them for renewal. We need to fuel them again to improve them. Some are just tired. They come home and they sleep. Then they sleep again. And they're not quite engaged. Another term, and probably I should have been a bit careful because these are technical terms, people who become overwrought. It's a term when people are kind of wound up they're not easy to settle. They easily become disturbed. So emotionally, they're not very stable. So often what happens is when we as leaders or we as um, workers or when I go to do interviews with staff, I meet tension because people are tired, burnt out, stressed. And my job and your job is to, how can we address this issue? So we look at the individual, we need to send them for renewal, we need to get them a health check, we need to give them an opportunity to do a new master's course. We try to think of solutions. But what we are not looking at is often why they are like this. What's the cause for this people being upset, stressed, mavericks. What's the causes? I've put there, and I, literally I just did this with brainstorming. But you would know, and I know, especially if we're working with sisters, that often one of the tensions is about power. Who's telling us what to do, how we're told to do it, I sometimes feel I don't have any influence. I don't have any capacity. There is another force that is controlling the power. I can give many instances. If I give just an instance of um, refugee work, sometimes the movement of people 
makes me unable to do anything. I worked for some years in a detention centre with 20,000 people, 20,000 locked up in a prison. There was very little I could do because the detention centre center was so powerful. It made people feel awful. So I couldn't change that. So I was caught in the setting. It would be like if you were working in a prison or um, as I say, sometimes I've worked in some of these islands where people are put, they put the refugees on an island and leave them there. And I'm trying to do some negotiation with governments, but I have little power. So when I see the refugees, I see people upset, people attempting suicide. I can try to help them, but somebody has to look at the power. Lack of support. We sometimes send people away on mission. We send people to work in complex settings. And this one has been quite interesting for me because sometimes now I find people saying, why did they send me? Why me? Did they want me to be away? They don't like me in the headquarters, so they send me a long way away. And sometimes it's not rational, but they feel that they are not supported. The congregation doesn't care about this mission. The congregation is building a new beach house. They're not giving us enough here. So they feel a lack of support. This one is probably the biggest issue that we're facing at the moment in complex settings and in ordinary settings. Sometimes the cause for people feeling disaffected, sad or stressed is gender imbalance. Is what can you do as a woman? And how is, how is your gender? Who listens to you? Do they listen more to other people than to you because of, not because of what you know, but because you're a woman? Another one is just poor training. We send people because we think, oh, they're a good person, they can do this work or they can do that work. And yet really they're not, they don't have the full capacity to do it. The last one I think I have here is what I'm calling blurred boundaries. Often people, when they are working in the field, get too emotionally involved with the beneficiaries, with the people they're working with, with their co-workers. They don't know when to stop. They come home, they keep working, they go out in the morning, they keep working. They are in the office all the time working. They don't have a sense of boundaries between private life and work life. But the reason I have this model is because a lot of the time we work with above the ground. We work with on top of the tree. We try to fix the individual. But we don't look at what's the problem underneath that is making the person unwell, that is affecting their well-being. Now, I could talk about this forever in any context, but I think it's one of the biggest things that I want to say is that we need to be looking at the root causes as well as the example that we see up front when we meet people. So when we're caring for the caregiver, we need to be incredibly sensitive, not only to the caregiver, but to the forces that are influencing their work. And often we just address the needs of the individual and we are dismissive or without analysis of what I'm calling the root causes. So two things so far I've said. In the first model, what I've tried to say is there's many aspects to well-being, but one of the key aspects is involving the person in shaping their well-being, in influencing their well-being. So that's my first model. But the second model is 
when I'm looking at somebody's functioning or well-being in a complex setting, I can't just look at the person. I have to look at the social environment and to do an analysis. What are the impediments? What are the issues that are problematic? I'm now going to move to a third model. So this is all building on what helps. Just to introduce this model, it comes from, again, it's, it's about 10 years old. It's been slightly reviewed, but it's about 10 years old. And it comes from an organisation I'm not sure you'd be aware of yet called the Interagency Standing Committee, IASC. You can find it on the computer. IASC is the head of all the big organisations in the world. So, for example, it's the head of UNICEF, the UN Organisation for Children. It's the head of the International Red Cross. It's the head of um, World Food Programme, which is here. Um, um, the head of the um, agricultural organisation. So what happened um, to develop this is some years ago, all of the big UN, but not all UN, there are also other agencies, had the same problem as what we're talking about today. Their staff were not functioning. But also, people didn't know how best to work with communities, people in emergencies. What's the best model to work with people in emergencies? Do we bring in lots of psychiatrists or do we have other models? And as you know from your work in lots of settings, even if we think we should bring in lots of psychiatrists, there are no psychiatrists. I'll give an example. I worked in northern Uganda. Um, when we had the Lord's Resistance Army working there, there was lots of children abducted, but we didn't have any psychiatrists in northern Uganda. So we had to think, how do we help these children to recover normally? Not with psychiatric assistance, but just normally. What are the resources of the community? So anyway... What happened was the big powers of influence, I, you know, the, the UN, the Red Cross, they asked a group, what's the best model to work with people in emergencies? And some Catholic organisations, one that I was part of, were part of this work. We came up with a triangle, which will be a little bit familiar to you, but it's not the Maslow Triangle. So let me say that very quickly. But the first thing, the first part of this model that we developed was, and it's the same thing for us for working with people in complex settings, was the first thing we must do is make sure, and this is similar to Maslow, that we have basic needs met. Most people can survive complex and difficult settings if they have their basic needs. The next step is strengthening families and strengthening people being able to network with each other. In complex settings, what happens is families get pulled apart. Sisters get moved to live with people they're not so familiar with, so that becomes a bit of tension. I'll keep moving. I'll put the next bit up. But at the top of the triangle, only at the top of the triangle, did we agree that we need some people who want specialised services, counselling, psychotherapy. But the model... The model was one that said most people can manage in an emergency if their basic needs are met. Let me elaborate. I just put two figures on the side. When I'm looking at a population in complex settings, what is now agreed is that 
only a very small percentage of the population will need extraordinary help, as I say, like psychiatric help or intense therapy, two to three percent, small. So when I talk about Northern Uganda, or I can talk about Rwanda, Sierra Leone, you know, Vavunya, in, I can talk about many places, and a lot of them I've been to, the model that's now been agreed internationally is a small number of people need extra help. But the vast majority of us can survive and even be well and flourish if we have our basic needs met. So this model is a different model, but it's an agreed model to the fact that everybody is traumatized and everybody needs big assistance. The model is that we need to address the basic needs. I will elaborate. Turning my triangle upside down. The model that we think about in complex settings now is that a proportion of people will be severely affected. So if I'm right now in Gaza, or I'm living on the border with Israel, and there's ongoing conflict, surprisingly, but yet this comes through in the research, a lot of people are just getting on with their lives. Some are severely affected and need professional help, but not everybody. That's the model that's now being looked at. I was recently talking to a woman who's just come back from working in Cox Bazaar, Bangladesh, with the Rohingya. They are working with people who find a lot of the Rohingya people are getting on with their lives. They have small markets. The children are going to school. It doesn't mean that they're not affected, but with school and business opportunities, people will manage. I want you to think about this model when we're now thinking about our sisters. Because again, I think the model that we've talk, thought about in caring for the caregivers is we need to give them more spiritual help, more psychiatric help. This model is saying most of them just need their basic needs met. But I'll keep going. So this is a normal population. We're not yet in a complex setting. Again, using the same figure in any normal population here in Rome, there would be in Rome, in a normal situation, two to three percent of your population who needs psychiatric and complex help because of their background, their history, etc. In an emergency, this doubles. So in an emergency, there's, if there's a hurricane, a typhoon, which we have in some countries, um, or if we have an earthquake, or if we have war, the number of people severely affected doubles. But look at the number. It's not everybody. It's a small proportion. It's in a population, it's a large number of people, but it's not everybody being affected. Again, in normal situations, 10% of the population, maybe even 20% in emergencies, can have their well-being strengthened by supports. This, in our world, looks like Catholic social services, where we help people who are living on the street, we help women who have had domestic violence, so we offer them additional support, but on the whole, they can then get on with their lives. They are not so severely affected that they can't function as such. They can be assisted in well-being. For children, it means taking them to school. Often if we take children to school, we give them a safe setting that strengthens them in an emergency, in a complex setting. 
most people, most people can deal with their own daily problems with their own networks. Now, what happens though in complex settings in, in an emergency is there's a disruption of those networks. So I'm not saying that there's not problems in complex settings, but I'm saying think again about the model and how many people we think really need professional complex services. The model that I'm talking to you about is what we call a resilience model. You and I, and most people that we work with, especially in emergencies, have got quite a bit of their own capacity to bounce back. That's what resilience means. In a complex setting, it's complex, but with the right supports, people will manage. This is another way of looking at what I'm talking about. In a setting where there is just normal life, we have support networks, families, community, we have a mayor, we have all those structures, we have church that support us. But when there's an emergency or it becomes more complex, the safety net falls down. So where I would normally have been able to go and talk to my grandmother, my um, brother and sister, or to my superior, it's disrupted because they're not there immediately and I'm also finding it difficult to find people to talk to. What, what we are about is turning that around, helping people to go back up to not being as affected. So I'm going to now apply this model directly to our religious life question. If I look first of all at basic services and security in our setting. So if, if you take my model, and I'll go through the model again, I've got a model of well-being. I've also got a model where I'm trying to say that we have to be careful of knowing what the root causes are of the distress. So then we as a congregation or we as religious women or whatever we are, if we want to address the complex needs or support the complex um, needs of people in these settings, here's some of the things that this model tells us to do. First of all, look at the very basic one of security and services. Now on the side, when I was thinking about what would that be for us as religious, it's about training. Do we have people with the right qualifications and the right training to work in complex settings? Do they know about first aid? Do they know about what we also now call psychological first aid, how to listen to people who are distressed and not take the distress into my own body? So do we know how to do that? Do we train people to work well in those settings? I've been working recently with the um, Jesuit fathers and one of the areas we've been looking at is one of the biggest dangers in our work is motor vehicle accidents. When I'm overseas, you get into the car, you don't know if the car has got a spare wheel, if it's been, um, it's, if there's air in the tire, if there's seat belts. A lot of religious have a lot of problems because of the cars. Another very dangerous setting in, um, in, in complex setting is roadblocks. It's when the police or the authorities stop you, they want to look at your passport, they want to, they, so all those sorts of things, we can give people, there's very good training in how to deal with those sorts of settings. When to, when to actually be in protective mode. There's courses in how to teach people protective driving. Now you might think this is very basic, but honestly, 
This is the sort of thing that keeps people alive and makes them feel safe. A comfortable living setting. By that I mean a setting where, there's, where people actually have um, time to be away from people for their own private life, their own private reflection. I mentioned earlier the internet, to be able to connect, to be able to ring family, to be able to ring a spiritual director, to be able to talk to their superior. I'm just gonna put a caution about that because one of the cautions is sometimes to be able to be accessed when you're in an emergency by people in Rome or by people in France can sometimes distress somebody because it gives what we call cognitive dissonance. People are working hard in a setting, they're not sure people understand, and now people are ringing up to say, oh, we're missing you, we're having a community party, and people are like, oh, I wish I was there. So accessibility can have two sides. But on the whole, we need to make sure that people have good living standards, good food, good water. I was recently hearing about one of our work settings in Chad, and it's very expensive in Chad, and the staff have to buy water because there's no water. If we help the staff have water, I think we'll increase their well-being. So this model is one of, first of all, make sure the basic needs are met. Make sure people have what they need in order to flourish. Recreation. I say recreation because international organisations have um, rules or policies. We do as well. In the old days, in some orders, you know, you're allowed to go on home, home leave every four years. Is that the right amount? Or you can have um, a retreat and a holiday, but it's only for a small amount of time. So the policies or the practice that we have for people, the caregivers, needs to be constantly reviewed. But the model that I've talked about in the first model is with them involved in the review. What do they think they need? Not what does headquarters think they need? So a negotiation as such. Our education and training, I could say a lot more about because when you work in complex settings, you are often working alongside, alongside trained workers people from Catholic Relief Service, people from the UN, do our people have the same skills and capacity so that they are peers, they are equal with others in the complex setting? Similarly, with the issue I've said of gender, do our people have the same resources as other males in the church so that we can equally contribute? So in one sense, to care for the caregivers, this first model would say, for most people, we just give them good basic services and they will manage, they will flourish. We don't have to do anything more sophisticated. For some people, remember now I'm talking about the population, most people will manage with the basic services. Some of the caregivers will also benefit from additional services. I mean, we all will benefit from additional services. But for us, that can look like a renewal program. Or it can look like some time out, where people are taken out of the setting just to sort of regroup and reconsider what they need to do. But it's much more a kind of, again, and I'm going to use this word policy, what's our understanding or policy and procedure for people working in complex settings? Do we have an understanding and do the people who are in the complex setting understand what is the expectation? 
So that's another whole area. I've used the term rest and recreation, and that's because of this term I've said about blurring of boundaries. Do people really take adequate rest? Because as you know, if you don't have enough rest, it affects your decision making, the cognitive, the emotional, it starts to affect the spiritual, it starts to affect all the aspects of well-being. So again, it's a, it's a question of us having good expectations on people and keeping them to those expectations, not letting them decide when they're not in good form. This is, this is um, for people who work in complex settings where we think some people, but it's a small group, need some more focused assistance. This could be, this is a term that's now used a lot in uh, my humanitarian work, supervision. Another word is mentoring or coaching. Now, internationally now, what's happening for people who are working in complex settings is that they have somebody who is independent, not in the community, who they can talk to or even email, who can give them a listening ear, but a professional listening ear. So I can talk to them if I'm a, um, if I, my job is a social worker or if my job is a teacher with children, I can talk to this person about what I'm doing and they help me to understand if I'm doing too much of one thing. They listen, a bit like a spiritual director, but they have the skills to feed back comments. All of us, all of us, people in Rome, in headquarters, anywhere can benefit from supervision. It gives, it's like checking in. And normally a supervisor can help to hear if there's something in those root causes. What else is going on? So a good supervisor can actually listen well and come to ask relevant questions that can challenge if people are um, not functioning well. Just to say a tiny bit more about this, it's often difficult in remote settings, but nowadays we have Zoom or we have Skype. It's become much more accessible. In some agencies, they now make it that everybody must have supervision once a month for their professional work. Now, for us, I think we have to think about this model because we sometimes, I think, blur supervision with spiritual direction. They're not the same. Remember, they are related, but they're not the same. So sometimes we can have a very good spiritual director, but they're not good at understanding my professional work working with traumatized children, working with women who are victims of domestic violence or who are trafficked. We need a professional who can bring some of that distance. So that's something that can be more supportive. There's a new term, um, when I say new, it's about five years old now. This is one that comes from um, a lot from the Red Cross where we train communities, we train school staff, we train women working in refuges in what we call psychological first aid. This is training people to work in settings with distressed people. It looks like a two day training. Then it might have another follow up in a month's time. I'll give you an example. It's an example from a Western setting, but nowadays, if there was something terrible that happened in a school, in, when I teach in America and the universities now, we have these shootings. In the past, a lot of people would say, oh, this is absolutely terrible. We must send in 30 counsellors. 
to work with all those children and their parents and the community. Now the thinking is, yes, some people will need counsellors, but others just need help in ordinary people listening to each other and supporting each other. And this is what is the model of psychological first aid. It's first aid. It's, the, it's your neighbours, it's your friends who listen to you, who support you. This is a model we know very well. You know, when somebody's sick, we bring them food, we visit at their hospital, we hold their hand, we talk to them. That is psychological first aid. It doesn't always mean psychiatrists and psychologists like me. It means you or your communities being skilled in listening, in empathy, in understanding. And in complex settings, this now is one of the first things that we introduce. They, they have just been doing a big training in Bangladesh to help the community help themselves. Another, another thing that we need, um, I think, is sometimes to train our sisters, even at the headquarters at the general at level, to have some understanding of mental health. There's words around, some of the words trauma. Trauma is a very complex term. A lot of people say, oh, somebody's worked in, um, like me, I have worked in Afghanistan. Oh, Marianne must have post-traumatic stress disorder. No, not necessarily. I might have some depression, I might have some anxiety. What's the right word? We, we sometimes use a language that kind of, what we would call pathologizes or makes clinical somebody's experience. A lot of us now just use the word distress. If you're in a complex setting, it's easy to be distressed. If you're distressed, it's easy -er for your leader to know how to help you. But if somebody says she's traumatized, the temptation is, oh my God, we need to get a psychiatrist quickly because we don't know what to do with trauma. So we have to be careful with our language as well. And again, from the evidence, a smaller number need clinical help. But a lot of us just need good first aid, not clinical help. So now I come to the clinical help, or what we call the specialised. So again, if I, using my model, which is an agreed model, if I'm working in a setting that's complex, what's been agreed now internationally is only a small percentage of people need specialised services. A small percentage. Remember, 2 to 3% normally in an emergency may be double that, 6%. So when you think about, OK, I've got 100 sisters working in Mindanao, or well, maybe six of them might benefit from specialised services. But the rest will manage well if they have basic services, good supervision, if they have a, a healthy environment, they'll manage well. Only a few will really need clinical support. So this is now a question for us is of what I would call referral. What we need in these particular settings is for congregations and sisters to know good people who can offer to religious appropriate psychiatric services. Now, in this instance, I'm not meaning hospital, psychiatric, but I'm meaning would the person benefit from some cognitive behavioural therapy, would they benefit from, um, we, knew, we have this language now, mindfulness? Would they benefit from yoga? Would they benefit from some good rethinking of how to cope and manage? It's a specialised service, 
But I guess what I'm continually wanting to say is anybody who works in a complex setting, they don't all need psychiatric supports. What we need as the leaders is to understand their needs, to understand the root causes of their needs, and then with them to see what will support them. And the vast majority will just need more basic supports, not the clinical supports. This has almost been a revolution because a lot of us think you work in a complex setting, you've been for a disaster, you need psychiatric help. The revolution is no. Most people are resilient. Most of our people are very able to bounce back, but they need services to help them, but much more at the basic level. I'm just going to say two more things, and then I'm coming to an end for discussion. There are also now some principles that underline this work that I'm talking about. The one in red I'll start with at the bottom. People need, as I've been saying, multiple layers of support. We've normally just jumped to the top. We need to get them a good doctor. But now the thinking is it's multiple layers and a lot of people, as I've said a, long, a lot of times today, a lot of people need just support at the basic levels. It needs to be integrated. So it's not just about addressing their spiritual needs or their health need. It has to be holistic. The science is evolving the whole time and helping us with this. We also need to build on what's available. So the, the, the notion that in the past we would fly in experts or bring people out, oh, sorry, bring people out to foreign settings is not helpful. What's the basic capacity there and how can we strengthen it? What can we do to strengthen the whole church in that space or the whole congregation, all the other congregations? So rather than working with individuals, how can we work collectively? Do no harm. That is a very strong principle in my work. Don't introduce something that you can't perpetuate, that you can't keep doing. A model that is foreign, a model that is an intervention that doesn't feel right. So we have to be culturally sensitive. We have to know what the resources are. The top two are difficult for religious life. Participation. Let the affected people tell us what they feel, what they want, what they think should happen. We tend to often, under obedience or under our model, do for them. We tell them what should happen. Whereas active participation helps people to grow, to develop. The last or the top, this is also about human rights. Now, this is something that's not always our language, but people have a right to education, they have a right to freedom, they have a right to participation. How does that look like in our religious life? They also have a right to equality. In my order, and I think in many orders, we say we are all leaders, but then there's the leaders. So how do we let people show leadership in a structure that's quite hierarchical. And that's about equal voices, especially the voices of the affected because they know best their situation. Which brings me to my last slide. Policies. Nowadays, this is the biggest area. If you listen with me to, or look at the media, the biggest challenge we have in the media now, we have this expression, me too. The me too is about gender. We've seen in the media Oxfam in Haiti. 
um, CAFOD in the UK, very good Catholic organisations being challenged because of their staff's behaviour. In the Catholic Church, which as you know is so painful, we have the whole area of abuse. And we are nowhere near the end of hearing about that. What policies do we have as congregations to keep our communities well and functioning? Now, policies is not constitutions, it's not chapter acts, it's policies. So nowadays, a lot of us are working on codes of conduct for our staff as well as our sisters. What do we expect of people's behaviour? How do we expect people to function around money, around internet, around children? If we are not explicit, we are open to people abusing their authority. So it's a hard thing to say, but it's a strong thing. And it's coming through as the church is one of the organisations asked to be more accountable. But this helps well-being. If people know what, how we want them to behave, then we can challenge their behaviour. It's not a surprise. It's there in writing what they're to do. I'm very happy in the future to talk with groups about this. The second one is, and it's a topic that's becoming very big in the Catholic Church, child safeguarding. How do we keep children safe in our schools, in our, if we have orphanages or homes? Do we have best practice? And this is also something at the bottom of the triangle. Do we have doors that have got windows so you can see what's happening inside the room? Have we checked all the staff to make sure they have good practice and they have police checks? These are all practices now that are becoming mandatory. The gender policy is a tricky one for religious. How do we work with um, other staff, male and female? What's our expectations? But there's a lot of demand now on us having good policy. And the last one that I've put there, there's many more I could put, is harassment. There are now allegations about bullying, bullying where people are feeling that they are put under pressure because of power and um, don't have any capacity to interact themselves. Now, I'm aware that I could be saying some things that are a little bit controversial, but what I'm basically saying is when we are working with people in complex settings, we need to be very clear about what are our expectations. We also need to be very clear about what's the responsibility if somebody acts inappropriately. Because this helps people to remain safe and to participate because they know what they have to do. If it's hidden, they don't always, they get a surprise or they get a shock when somebody rings up and says, you, we've had a complaint against you. What? Because they don't know explicitly what's asked of them. So we need as religious to be a lot clearer. Now I'm just going to wrap up because I know I've gone to time or a bit over time possibly. I've presented three models. The first model is that caring for the caregiver is about well-being and well-being has at least seven elements and all of those elements need to be addressed. But also we want the people that we're caring about to be part of addressing that. That's becoming very clear. The second model is, don't just work with what's on the surface. Do some analysis as to what's causing the problem. This is something that some of us are better at than others. But if people are in complex settings, why is it complex? 
What's shaping our sisters and our staff's behaviour? What's under the surface that's making the problem? So instead of just fixing one sister, look at the system. The third point, and I know I could elaborate it more, is that for many of us, we will keep well and functioning in complex settings if our basic needs are met. We don't need just, as I keep saying, psychiatrists or psychologists. A small number might need extra care, but most of us just need basic conditions and good policies, and we're going to be able to do our work well. If there's an emergency, we might need a little bit more, but we will bounce back. On the whole, most people are very resilient, and what we are about in religious life is helping them to flourish, helping them to continue to be able to do their work. I'm happy to later on take questions. I'm happy to elaborate this in smaller settings, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marianne. I remain in front of the computer like that, listening to you, and I told myself we should invite her at the USG because perhaps you can help us. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think now we have two options. Uh, we can have a break and then come back for some uh, dialogue. If you have some questions, we can also give the flow to the people who are following online, or we can have the question now and then we can have the break. I would suggest to have the break now, if you agree, okay? Is it okay for you? So we have 20 minutes of break. I think we have something to have in the other room, something hot, and then we come back in 20 minutes here for a dialogue with Sister Marianne. Thank you very much.
Okay. Um, now is an opportunity for you to ask me any questions about what I've said or what I haven't said. I'm very happy to talk about both. Who has the first question? Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you for your white, more practical, even though it's not uh, it can be hard to implement, but it is more concrete in a life of everyday, many categories of people, especially to me, as I'm working here. And I wish to ask you to take you back to the second model, please. The second model. Thank you. The blurred boundaries mm. and the supervisor supervision. Because as a leader, we can have this sense of responsibilities concerning also in my in my understand the the person in a leader or who has many responsibilities can be also this um, the tendency to to control over all the activities or the people whom is in charge of we can have this um, weak weak part of flourishing the people, promoting, instead of promoting, can, can control, or I can say can, can uh, take over of the many activities. Mm. And then what about, so the connection between now, uh, it is, you said supervisor, no? We have mm. to supervise all. And what is the connection, please, if you can just give more. Thank you. It stopped again. Um, no, it's the opposite. We do it. Okay. It's okay. I can talk now? Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. So, blurred boundaries. This is when, as you say, there's, I put another term there as well, role confusion. But let me say first about blurred boundaries. Sometimes, and when we are working with populations who are distressed, we become the helper. We, we don't have what I would call a professional distance. We try to rescue them. We try to save them instead of helping people to get onto their own two feet. So we become like the martyr is one word that we could use, or we become like the saint and we are doing everything. Now for a short time, you can do that, but the risk is one of burning out because you are helping this person, you are doing this, this person needs me, I can't take a rest because this congregation needs me or whatever. Nobody is indispensable, nobody. And that's a hard message because when you are working in an emergency or in a complex setting, you can think 
I am the only one. The others are not helping. I am the best. Um, this week I was talking to a staff worker um, who has been working in the Middle East. And he was telling me, I know everything. I have been here, I've been there, I've been there. When I was listening to him, in my head I was really, because it was too much. Now sometimes when there's um, a big emergency, we throw ourselves in and we don't keep, as I said, a boundary. So we don't sleep properly. We, another example, I remember once a sister working with refugees, not from your congregation, not from mine, and somebody wanted to get married. They needed a little bit of money. She gave them her profession ring. And I'm like, really? Was that, you know, like she, she went over. And I was thinking, I'm not sure that that's a good, you can be understanding, but you don't always have to go into your pocket to find or to give something. Why did she need to go that far? So supervision is when you talk about what you have been doing honestly and openly, and the supervisor can question you gently, but professionally. What were you responding to? Were you responding to the person or were you responding to your needs to be special? It's not easy. All of us have um, challenges, but supervision can help us to see why we are doing this and not this. And it gives you a bit of distance to stand back and to look at your work. And sometimes a community cannot do that because you're all caught together. And then we have the issue in a community that somebody is the community superior or the treasurer, so they have other roles. So I've also used the word role confusion. I've seen this many times in religious life where in the community, the superior is clearly the superior, but one of the community members might be the headmistress of the school, two authorities, and there becomes confusion as to who makes which decision about dates or what we do or when we do it. And there's a little bit of not collaboration. So sometimes an independent person from, uh, we call it in chapters a facilitator, but often in an emergency, we don't have these um, skilled people, but you need somebody who can help to look at the situation and make some comments. So the, with this model, sometimes if we're right in the middle of the situation, it's hard for us to do an analysis. We need to stand back and somebody else needs to come to ask questions that helps us to do the analysis as such. It's the same thing with my personal and professional life. My personal life, a spiritual director can sometimes make a comment, you know, oh yes. And the same thing with a supervisor, they can comment on your professional work. But you need to be sure which one's which. You know, so, so when I'm talking about um, blurred boundaries, we religious, I think, are not always good at being clear that I'm working as a professional or I'm working as a sister or how I'm working. And the other problem that comes is that sometimes people ask us to do something that's not in our role description, in our job description. And because I'm a sister, I think, oh, yes, I will do that. And I'll do that. And I'll do that. And I'll do that. And I'll do that. I think it stopped now. Yeah. So is that making sense, what I'm saying? You know, where we, because we're religious, we go beyond. And nowadays I'm saying that that might not be the best thing unless we have good supervision to help us. 
so that we can see what what we are doing and why we are doing it. Yeah. Marianne, I have a couple of questions yes. from people online. The first one is, how do we enhance the resilience that we already have? And the second question is a more, a little bit more complicated. Uh, thank you very much, excellent. It is the comment and the question is, what are the stages that an inter intercultural, intergenerational, intercongregational community or group normally go when work in an emergency setting? What specific help can we provide in those stages? Um, okay, thank you for both questions. Um, the question of resilience, um, a lot of it's about knowing yourself and knowing your team as such. What my model is saying that all of us can be resilient, but how resilient we are in certain settings is determined by genetics, by personality, by experience. It's multi factors that shape our resilience. So it's a little bit like the model I was saying for congregational leaders and general at teams. It sometimes helps us to have a model of um, language about mental health. I think we could also have a language about resilience. We could also understand what it is that shapes a person and their development. And the resilience language is a language that's been around for 20, 25 years. Now we also have, you know, the language, as I've said, of mindfulness and uh, mastery. There's a lot of contemporary language around psychosocial work. I think I would be saying at this stage to actually explore that language with some helpful professionals can help us know as leaders what we're looking for in our sisters. It's very good to look at in our formation. What, what are the elements of resilience that we want to strengthen? And how can a religious order strengthen individuals' resilience? The second question is a little bit related. It's completely true. Nowadays, um, especially as we as religious life becomes smaller, we do a lot more intercongregational work. Um, we have intergenerational work and we have different expectations of different generations. Um, we also have different cultures and different cultures have different ways of communicating as we know and different ways of expressing distress or um, str stress. The best thing I can say about this is the need for transparency and communication. With transparency, I'll go back to procedures and guidelines. If things are more explicit, more public and more known, and this can be policies or as I say, it can be guidelines, then it means there are no surprises. There are no hidden agenda. The problem though is with policies and procedures, to have them just written is just the beginning. There needs to be a training or an introduction as to what this means in implementation, in reality. And I think if we're working intercongregationally or interculturally or intergenerationally or all three and more, we need to have some common forums where we explore together. So I'll give an example. Many years ago now, I went to Cambodia to talk about child protection. I also went to Cambodia to talk about stress. Now in Cambodia, I had to learn a lot about Buddhism. I had to learn a lot about what is the concept of a child, what is the concept of an adult, and what's um, an adult who's not married, who are often then considered still children, even though they might be 20, 21, 22. So I had to learn a lot. So we had to do a lot of dialogue. 
So it wasn't me coming in to give procedures or policy, it was us working together. So it's that shared involvement. Nowadays, as I say, we're doing a lot of inter-congregational work. People have different understandings of leadership, of obedience, of um, community life, and what's appropriate and what's not. This must be more transparent. It must be more talked about how to get permissions, who can have access to the resources, who controls the resources, all needs to be a lot more known. Otherwise, it becomes personalities. And once it's personalities, we're in trouble because personalities will assume different sort of um, authority and that makes for personal conflict. So it's a lot about, as I said, communication, but making sure that um, what we want to have happen can be talked about. I've mentioned the word supervisor before. Sometimes it's very helpful to have what I'm calling an outsider. Somebody to come in with new eyes and to look at the dynamics and to help people to talk independently to somebody to say, I'm having this problem or that so that there can then be a way of working to resolve it. Just putting people together in an emergency without any of this is a disaster or a recipe for disaster because we can't presume everybody will respond the same way. We all respond differently, even if we're resilient, because of our background and experience. And that needs to be a lot more explicit. I know I'm just touching the top of lots of psychological concepts here. Yeah. I have another question from, it's okay, Marin. Mm. Uh, she's Maria Jose. Uh, she's a psychologist. She's a sister. And her question is, how can we as religious women combine the answer to the urgent needs of refugees now with the small professional preparation for such, for such challenging context that our sisters sometimes have. How to respond quickly to an urgent cry, even though our sisters are not fully prepared professionally? And she, she also thanks for the conference. Okay, no, th and thank you again. Um, Many congregations, including my own and some of the ones I've worked with, have made a priority to work with refugees. It's not a surprise that in these days, these years, it's one of the priorities. But you're completely right. We don't even sometimes have a common language. Who's a migrant? Who's a refugee? Who's an asylum seeker? And what are their different entitlements in um, our countries? What are their needs? What are the possible pathways for them? Many, many years ago, even centuries ago, a lot of our congregations had the priority of children or women. And over the time, we have built an expertise. So a lot of us know a lot about how to work with children or how to work in hospitals. But this area of refugee and migrant also needs some expertise. It needs also what we are good at, which is our pastoral presence, our accompaniment of, with them. But I would really encourage congregations to do a little bit of um, maybe in-house training. There's some very good resources so that we have a common language and even a common understanding as to how we can empower these people and not just be a charity, but help them to manage their own lives. Um, it also helps, um, I think, for us to have an understanding of what people have come from, what their reality has been. I know here in Italy, for example, we have a lot of people who've crossed the sea Women have had terrible atrocities in places like Libya. We don't necessarily have to 
engage the people to hear their story before responding, but it's helpful if we have an, a, a political awareness, a geographical awareness of what people's experience has been. So like any other ministry, it's one where we need informed people. It's not one that we can just walk into. I know that um, the Holy Father has invited us to open our houses, and I certainly think that's a wonderful invitation, but we need to also um, have a knowledge, as I say, to what the pathways for these people are, what their options are. Otherwise, we can give them false hope. We can give them um, charity that doesn't help them to move on. So where we've worked in the past to help enable people, we can sometimes, in other areas, we sometimes have not applied that to the refugee setting. So my encouragement is to, um, to do some strategic thinking about this area. And if it's an area we're gonna spend more time in, I think that's fantastic but it's helpful to get some training or some input so that we know what we're doing. We have to know what we're doing in health, in education. The same thing with migrants and refugees. We have to have an idea of what we want to be doing and not just reacting. So I think it's, it's an area that, and I know that um, some organisations are thinking about this, but I think it could do with some more strengthening, if I can say that. Thank you. What else can I tell you? Marian, I have a question. <laughs> because sometimes also the sisters uh, say that it's very difficult to analyze the situation when you are within the situation. So my question is, do you think that we uh, always need to call an external people, a supervisor, a facilitator to help us? I think the answer is no. If we say always, then I think we're in trouble. Um, in, in congregations, some of us have very skilled people. And as I say, more and more now we are working together in collaboration. So sometimes the external person can be from another congregation who can help us, or somebody from our own congregation that we recognise has the, the skills. There is, in terms of analysis, there's a lot of um, people who are doing what we call theological reflection, where we are looking at um, the scriptures, we are looking at the social setting, and we are also then looking at what we are going to do. Some of us are skilled in some parts of that and others in other parts. It's in the Cardine movement, we used to call it See, Judge, Act, where we use our faith to see, like, for example, that there are many migrants now coming to Europe or to Bangladesh or to Libya or why? That's the judge. That's where we use our um, information from the internet, from sisters who've been in those places, with a view to coming to an action. What is it that our congregation can, can do? And congregations will come to different solutions. Some will give money, some will give housing, some will give personnel, some will send sisters to Bangladesh, whatever, based on our resources and our capacity. But I think what's important is to have those elements, the listening to the migrant, seeing what the reality is, listening to the scriptures, our love of the stranger, our welcoming the stranger, what does this mean for us now? 
What does Exodus mean? What is the challenge that we are being called to as religious? But instead of going, that call, let's act. In the middle is the reflection. What is the need? And why is there this need? And some of us will end up doing advocacy. Some of us will end up doing mission work. Some of us will end up doing feeding and charity. There's many responses. So sometimes it's more, it's not so much the external facilitator or the supervisor, it's making sure we've covered all the bases, as they say in baseball. It's making sure we've done the good discernment. That's a very good word for us to use, where we have looked at the reality and we've looked at our strengths and our weaknesses. Of course, the gospel impels us to respond, but there are lots of choices of response. So it's really to move um, with our hearts, but also our heads to respond. And there are very good people who can help us. Um, the Vatican has its own secretariat that looks at refugees. I've heard people talk about the Scalabrinis. There's the Jesuits have a refugee service. There's an expertise. Now, I'm using the example of refugees. I could be using it also of trafficked women or trafficked boys. The refugee situation is the one I know, but what I'm recommending is a model that goes across all of our responding to new ministries. Um, there are things are coming more quickly to us because of technology, um, but we need to have ways of, as I say, discerning what's the congregation's response. But what I'm saying inside of that is if we are using our personnel, our sisters, and now our lay companions, we need to strengthen them so that they can do this work. So, for example, just to open a house to migrants without making sure that the community has the um, boundaries, has the resources, can keep the place safe, it's not a good response, I would say. So again, it's with the heart, but also with the, with the head. And the challenge nowadays is for us to do that quickly. So it means we need to identify in advance people who um, can respond or people who can help us to look at the response. Because the world is shrinking, if I can say that. Um, just to give an example, um, again, I work, do a little bit of work in the US the issue of terrorism was never an issue when I started doing this work. Now it's an issue. So when I'm training people for working in the US or in um, global settings, we need to have that in our mind. What would we do in something if something really big happened? What's the response? So we, instead of waiting for it to happen, we anticipate as such. So sometimes I say to my social work students, what would a social worker do in this setting? What's the skills you would bring? So I imagine scenarios. I hope they will never happen, but they might. So if you can understand what I'm saying is that the more anticipation and preparation we do, the more we are ready to respond. If we just sit and then suddenly move from naught degrees to 100 degree response, we can make problems. So it's knowing what resources the congregation has, knowing what we want to do. But of course, like our foundress, we also need to take some risks. I don't want to remove that. I think it's important, but we also need to be sensitive to the implications of the risks. Um, and these days we have more knowledge about that. Does that make sense to you? I can see a few nods. Hmm. 
Well, I think I might have told you everything I know. Um, let me just let me just um, repeat. In the future, for events like this, I'd be happy to sort of um, again. And there's other people who can do this to elaborate. I've introduced a lot of concepts, and it would be helpful to feed back to the. Um, organization, what you would find more helpful, what you want to know more about, because in the future we could do more work in this, in this area. So this is just an introduction, as I say, to several models. But if you wanted a deep dive into something more, if you tell the um, organization, um, they can come back and say, we need to know more about this and I might be able to identify somebody or I might be able to do it myself. But I've enjoyed the work and um, being with you. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. So thank you very much, Marianne. I think it's worth it to have an applause for her. We are very grateful. We are very happy that we were able to record the English. We had some problem at the beginning with the Italian language, but we were able to record all the English videos, so we will share it very soon, if you allow us to do it. And we will share it on our YouTube channel so you can also share it or listen it again, trying to then adapt it to our reality because this is very important. So thank you very much. And I think we can invite you again for next year, perhaps to have something more, let's say, advanced, profound, mm -hmm. and to have a, like a one day workshop, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can keep thinking in 2019 or 2020 something like that. And before leaving, I would like to share with you a couple of other events that we are planning for next year. Now we're approaching Christmas, so we will take a time of break, repose. And next year, it's a very important year for USG. We have a lot of events behind the, besides the plenary where more or less 900 superiors general will meet here in Rome. So it's a huge event for us, very important. But I want to share two things. The first one is about a course that we are planning with the Justice and Peace Commission on migration and uh, from the religious sisters point of view that will start in January. You will find all the information on our website. and You can follow the course in English, Spanish, Italian, both live or online. But you need to register. Um, second is a workshop, a three-day workshop in February. This is completely free because there is a foundation who pays and it's a training program for academics. I mean, for sisters, who will teach at university level, or they have to teach theology or biblical studies. So it's a, it's a training to, for a methodology to teach. It's just in English, so it's a huge opportunity for your sisters who manage this language to come. It's a three day here at the USG, just in English for this time, but okay. So thank you very much again for coming. We were a very small group, but it was very good. Thank you. And thank you to the translator and my colleague Florence that was able to arrange everything behind. Thank you.
when you have a new customer, yeah, yeah. you can sure, uh, sure. let's say from September on okay. next year. No problems. Thank you.